All right. Uh, good evening, guys. Kenneth Tortoise Capital uh, Foundations check in for November 16th, 2023. Um, uh, a series of questions from Joe. Uh, what are the dates for the research weekend? Um, I am flexibly collecting uh, presentations from everybody in the month of November. And then when I have all those, uh, I'm uh, I'm going to organize some weekend uh, Q and A sessions, like three on a Saturday, three on a Sunday, and have guys sign up, and then we'll publish that. But in the meantime, if you have questions or comments, uh, go right into Rizuku. That's the where the course is hosted, and you can just uh, use the discussion and uh, and collect. We're going to use that as the collection point for questions that you have of the uh, authors. So try to get try to get as much of those done as you can in November, and then uh, then we'll host a probably a ninety minute session with each author, and then go over their questions, and that'll all be recorded and added to the to the workshop as well. Uh, I end up putting a lot of extra materials in there. And so uh, I'm going to probably go last on that one. Um, the way that's currently organized, just for the record, um, there's a bunch of works in progress. And these are, you know, like current students reporting on uh, the work that they've been doing for the last year, along with some coaching uh, that goes along with that. Um, the five critical states video in there is one that I am providing to EdgeRater so that they can understand how the sniper trading leverages compound critical states and what the five states are and how we're going to use EdgeRater to help us find those uh, and filter for those choices. Um, now, this next set are... I would say from more senior students, uh, mine is a catch-all. I probably have 40 videos in that one that are kind of like the best of um, either coaching sessions or many lectures over the last five years of COVID that I think are just still timely and useful. Uh, Bob, Jim, and Matthew are all pro money managers. They've all been um, my clients and co-conspirators for 15 or 20 years. Um, Bob is one of my original five uh, subscribers. I've uh, been working with him for over 20 years. And same with Jim Carroll, who's going to add some things on volatility systems. Matt Richardson is a very interesting guy. He's a PhD in, I think it's in biochemistry and also a corporate tax lawyer. And he discovered investing and trading from Jim and then started coming on Jim's recommendation to the research weekends, starting about 12 years ago. And now his transition to becoming a full-time RIA at Still Point Investing. Still Point Investing, where he is a junior partner to a guy named Gary Antonacci, who is a very well-respected uh, quant uh, money manager and author. He's an artist, not just a meister. Um, and then I think he's about getting ready to retire in the next three to five years. And uh, Matt is probably going to um, uh, take over the, uh, the trading book for him. Um, my brother is going to talk about the three-day, nine-day. Phil and Griff are going to have a bunch of things about um, not just the Kata 2 challenge, which is this, uh, but Phil is going to do something. He's been working with Edge Raider and Chris White, and this is a pretty powerful Excel-based application that, uh, that does backtesting and filtering and some what-if analysis and... Um, so I've given him our five sniper templates and all the swing templates. And he's building templates into Edge Raider that will 
essentially automate the mechanical swing trading, the sniper filtering, and the auto framer inside Edge Raider, and it'll allow you to do some back testing of different uh, exit strategies, adjustments of the rules, and gives you, um, you know, essentially real time back testing. So, Phil, uh, I'm, I'm going to have him develop a course that combines those two features of Edge Raider. One of them is the you know, filtering and finding, and the other one is back testing. And so there's going to be an edge raider course. Uh, and then eventually I'm going to have Griff do a swing trading course that does for swing trading what the Kata 2 challenge does for day trading. So both of those guys are going to have materials in there. You guys, I think, already know Jeff and Bill. They're going to talk about uh, PRX, and Bill's going to do some stuff with modified blended monthly rebalancing. Uh, Jeff and Sonal are partners over in the UK. They're going to, uh, I've got some of the, their best of ideas from psychology and systems testing and back testing and trading view. Luke is going to do some work on uh, work in progress. I'm going to talk to him later tonight about the, he's got about two years of daily trading where he was doing his own adaptation of Kata 2 and hybrids, uh, five minute Aussie. And so he's uh, he's turning that into an RIA business. And uh, he's going to brief some materials on his extensive back testing, but also his forward trading. Now, he's an accountant in Australia with seven kids, and he is a serious person. Um, this, These two here from Joe, Tom, and Ernie really are, I would call, on the soft skills side that talk about how to set up and perform accountability groups and how those guys work together. And that is really uh, some amazing stuff about how to socialize um, the trading journey and develop partnerships uh, with other people. So I think they've done just a really excellent job. So that's all in there as well. Um, this set here, some uh, lessons and master classes. This is an additional 20 that I, I thought I had it all done after the other 40. But I wanted to, uh, I just kept, as I kept drilling deeper and deeper into the material and, re and our own research, I wanted to uh, just highlight some stuff. And this is some stuff that came out of Creativity 202 course and some work that I was doing with the super traders and coaching. And then a list of... I went back through 10 years of video podcasts that I'd done for the Tharp Institute. and actually turns out to be about 20 really good hours of, um, uh, of current events and emerging strategies. Um, Dwight asked, does Edge Raider use XLQ? No, it, it queries a quote server directly and works natively in XLQ with his own uh, C++ and Python code to automate. And there's not just our templates in there, but there's a bunch of templates that he's done to um, uh, model some world-class traders. And I was really kind of honored to be thought of, you know, as, as a guy whose templates could fit inside there. So Edge Raider is a really powerful tool set, but it also has some practical trading applications. He's going to end up giving us a 50% discount on buying the tool set, which is buy once, have for life. Uh, and then he charges, I think, 300 bucks a year for the data source. I think he's using Nord, Nordgate. Um, but um, so if you end up going there and looking at it, wait to get the coupon. And he's announcing a new release and an update to the software because of the stuff that we've added uh, to his work. So he's a really nice guy and smart. And his application is bulletproof. He used to be an app developer for Microsoft back in the day. Um, now this one here, the showcase, these are some things that came out of back briefs from foundations courses and uh, creativity courses that are really good presentations on work that our traders have been doing and reporting on um, the, the inside game of trading. There's some 
just really good stuff. So there's, you know, basically there's a full year's worth of extra materials that are organized in these different groups. Um, and so I can, I can, uh, I can tell you that it's pretty, pretty comprehensive uh, collection that goes back through, you know, the last 10 years of our uh, previous research weekends and, and updates. So I'm uh, pretty happy with uh, the way this thing is shaping out. So I wanted to share that based on your question. Um, uh, the next question set was uh, regarding the multi-time frame, multi-lens analysis. And in the course, um, there is uh, some videos we did from a live workshop in 2019 that uh, showed examples working with DIA. Do I always look at that in addition to the S&P? Yes. Do I do the full analysis with all positions held? No. Nope. Um, I do them at, I do them weekly. And open positions I evaluate daily. And I'm really using like the 10, 30, 90 hybrid swing uh, lens, which is like a 10 day and 30 day mostly. And if it's interesting, I may look at the 90. So uh, I'm, I'm looking at all of those lenses, but really on the 30 minute um, and, and the daily, daily charts as the highest priorities. All right. Since I've written this, someone, I would probably also say, look, I like the nine day and the three day as those two intermediate ones. And I'm actually looking at those more than I'm looking at the weekly, if I'm being honest, because I, I, I just like those, the intermediate space between monthly, weekly, and daily. I, I like the extra unique look that those give us. Um, do I do the full analysis and all? No. Frog champions, no, because I look at the frog champions every night and I look at them on this, on the hybrid swing lens every weekend anyway. Uh, so I don't need to do this full up pattern. Um, what I have discovered is, is that when I do that hybrid swing lens, I'm actually looking at all those things anyway, but I'm not doing a separate uh, line item like, like, uh, like on MACD, um, I will I will take like the S and P and I'll go through that thing laterally. But what I do on the on the um, the hybrid swing is that if I'm looking at the daily chart, I look at all the symbols uh, on all. I look at one symbol on all of those for the whole symbol and look at the symbol once. When I'm doing it this way, I look through the symbols one lens at a time. And I find that that gives me the different the difference between lateral and vertical uh, is is refreshing and systematic in that sense. So there's a personal choice on that one. Uh, the symbols that I look at are first the S and P. I look at DIA because that's the conservative form of the S and P. And then I look at the Qs and Tech together because that's the aggressive form of the S and P. Like like the big seven tech giants that are responsible for most of the gains of XLK and, and the Qs represent about 30% of the market cap of the S&P. And the big seven names, which are all the ones that you would expect, you know, Google, Microsoft, Apple, Tesla, are up like seven times the rest of the S&P. So it's really those seven those seven heroes are producing most of the gains for the S&P and the Qs and XLK. So th these are just a couple different ways to look at the, uh, the large caps. Uh, that's why I look at those. I look at the mid caps and the small caps as alternatives to um, this collection of large caps. And I do that because I actually have some choices in some of my 401ks to be able to use blended monthly balancing on a mid cap index and a small cap index. Also on the 
this is the Euro Asia large cap blend. The um, and then this is the global emerging markets, and then I look at Brazil and Mexico. That's where I'm getting frog champions. I look at uh, real estate and treasuries as my alternate asset classes from the big stock indexes, and then I look at four of the uh, of the series of um, XL series. Um, XLK, because it is so closely correlated with the S&P, the Qs, and XLK. I mean, obviously, XLK connected to XLK. These other, uh, these other three tend to be cyclic sectors, that they rotate leadership. Like, if the market's going up, it's, it's not surprising that XLK is leading it up, and those two can last a long time. But XLE, B, and F, the energy, materials, and finance, tend to be cyclic for swing trading. And one of those could end up being the short-term leadership in this period. Like it might be XLB for that two-week period adding extra juice to the S&P. And then it's done, and then it cycles over to E, energy, and then over to F. And these three tend to be independent of each other, but they all have this characteristic of long uh, swing trade patterns that can last, you know, two weeks, 10 days, that kind of stuff. And those are, those are great, sec those four collectively give me my sector insights. The other ones uh, don't have enough volatility really um, to be interesting from swing trading. Uh, it's usually one of those four is leading the way, and one of those four is the serious laggard. So you get some, there's an efficiency of looking at those as sectors. Uh, and then all the frog champions, I'm looking at them every night anyway. And because I'm looking at both, you know, daily and two hour, I feel like I'm getting all of the actionable information for fog trading, which is a combination of intraday, but also short, short term swings. And, and that's literally what hybrid, I'm looking at frog champions for hybrid swings. Now, if that hybrid swing just keeps making legs up and up and up, I'm getting thin slices of that and getting chunks as we go. So if it turned out to be a long-term great thing that on monthly and weekly charts looks like a great trade, I will have gotten that one by virtue of the fact that for many of those weekly swings, it just kept going up better than all the other candidates. So I end up backing into those kinds of positions. And then I simply use the blended monthly rebalancing to get my long-term positions here um, through rewarding momentum plays. I think I've talked about that before. Uh, what kind of review? I do this weekly. I would suggest some weekend plan on doing it once a month for maybe the S&P and DIA and, uh, and the Q. So you get the U.S. large caps, blended, conservative, and aggressive. And then see how long the insights that you gathered from there are good for you. They may last you a full month. They may last you two weeks. They may last you a week. Depends how fast the market is changing conditions. I find that when I'm in sideways, or we're in sideways and bear, and then any volatile that the uh, frequency is it should it should be weekly if we're in a bull normal or bull quiet which is still most of the time then you could do it once a month and still be okay but when things are getting jumpy and nervous you probably want to do a weekly review because things can change that much so lately I just been doing it weekly And kind of just got into that habit during um, 
COVID, like in 2019. So that's actually pre-COVID. Monthly was enough. Uh, once I started doing nightly podcasts, the weekly felt correct. <clears throat> Next question was, um, do I put more decision weight on longer term support and resistance or the 10 and 30 day framing? Uh, it depends which system I'm looking at. And because 80% of my capital is in day and swing, 10 and 30 dominates the current time frame. So I will, I personally put more weight on the 10 and 30 day framings and the 90 to 70 and maybe the weekly monthly is really for BMR. And then I use the 10 period. I think of that as my fast aggressive positioning. And if I'm thinking like if I had the harsh winter and then I'm, I'm trying to play that standard curve. Like that's what I think about sector cycling for the XLB, E, F, and K. That it typically goes through this kind of feast or famine. Whereas the S&P might just kind of be kind of grinding like this through the middle, right? So the sectors end up giving me better performance. Well, if I'm trying to trade that blue curve, then I might pick something like, um, you know, if I break this into one sixth and the top one sixth, collectively that's one third. That leaves one third and one third. Uh, I try to, I'm hoping to get like SSCs or Cauda twos with five sixths of the move of the expected move still available. So, you know, if I can see what the size of those previous moves are and support and resistance and figure out the channel, like if this is where the last time the RL10 switched and I can figure, well, it might get to here. I want to try to get in around in here and hope that it gets all the way up there. So I'm trying to, and I'm treating the market like that, like chunks in that. I like to, if, if I want to blend this idea, I might look to get one third of my position size on overnight trading or swing trading or longer term swing or the three day, nine day. I might try to get one third of my position in here and then maybe a third here or two thirds here somewhere in this region. So once I've got some markets money in hand and a two hour battle drill, something like that. And then I, if I'm being aggressive on my exits, this is where I get more aggressive on the exit to preserve wins up here and take two thirds off when the 10 period says it's time to get out. And then maybe if I'm going to hold anything, keep one third. And when the owl, you know, the RL 30 rolls over, and it still hasn't recovered, then it's clear I should get out of that last little position. So if the RL30 looks like this, and the RL10 had already crossed under, and you know had crossed the dragon, and that was enough to get out of two thirds of the position somewhere in here. So I got two thirds out. What I'm hoping is that somewhere Somewhere in here, this thing does a quick reversal and and the RL10 resumes. You know, I'm hoping that it, I'm hoping that it will reverse so I can quickly get that two thirds back on. So that means I'm keeping a third and then that is actually my, my initial position is in place there already at the RL10 crossing the dragon. And maybe I can put a third there and then another third on the, um, the, uh, the emerging dragon, something like that. So I actually don't, I'm not voting between which one to follow, like the 10 or the 30. I'm really more interested in the 10 
and the 30, the 10 Union 30, whereas this is fast and aggressive, and this is slow and conservative. And on the entry, again, I'm putting maybe one third in and then two thirds follow up. But on the exit, I want to get two thirds out because I already have money in hand that I'm, I'm trying to preserve my money. So I'm more aggressive getting out than I am getting in with the RL10. And then maybe I'm only you know, exiting the final third when the OWL exit tells me to get out. Okay? So I would change the terms of the question just a little bit um, that I'm looking at the 10 and 30 together. Um, you've always thought the longer term patterns are more powerful than short term. I would generally agree with that, but I would also say that those long term, you know, RL270 kinds of moves that last forever, you could see, I should have made that purple. So if the RL70 is doing this, or RL270 is doing that, this might take nine months to unfold. And in that period of time, you might have seen, um, you know, the, the RL90 have two or three moves of clear distinction, like a clear reversal, a clear trend, a sideways chop for a while, another trend, and then a sideways chop. So you might see actual seasonal change when the climate itself, that's what I think of the RL270, is the, the climate for risk among the much higher time frames. Well, if that's the case, if, if you're trying to get the longer term pattern and not and you don't want to get involved in the noise in here, then you want to try to make decisions that are keyed into the characteristics of the long term patterns. But because those things are nine months, they could be nine months in length, and I'm 66 years old, uh, if that thing just is grinding, and it takes nine months to find out if it's going to go or not. Man, this could be three to five years, and I, and I got dead money. And, and meanwhile, there could have been some shorter-term opportunities that were clearly available in that period of time that were manageable for me. You know, I could have had some of this stuff going on. So... Um, I, what I find is that I want to go to the shortest term possible pattern that is still manageable, which is kind of why I like using the three minute and the 30 minute for the day trading and hybrid swing. And those two really work together to give each other information. That's the shortest period of time that I can consistently look at three or four symbols on three minutes span of control and 20 to 30 symbols on 30 minute and because I can that gives me enough concentration to have capital on big moves but it gives me enough diversity that I can look around to find something that's moving so again I don't think of it short or long-term patterns, what I think you need to do is say, which bucket of money am I dealing with? Am I dealing with the 20% that's in my core, the 40% that's in the swing, or the 40% that's in the day? And then there is a fast or conservative framework that's appropriate for that time frame. Like I may just be using the 10 and 30 on each one, but on this one I'm using the three minute and I'm using the 30 minutes, so I'm really emphasizing the 10 and the 30. That's the lowest level look back period that you can have that is still statistically significant. And what I'm actually doing is that 
the slow conservative pattern is the 30 period and that's the one that has that's the first look back period that has any claim to statistical significance and i know that the 10 period which is aggressive is really just a hint it's a speculation on what the 30 is later going to confirm but this does it in one third of the time and then it takes two thirds of the time to complete the 30 minutes so I can get a front run aggressively intuitively shadow knowledge but I can front run what's going to end up being the statistically significant one so so for me the 10 and the 30 is what I really concentrate on and then I just I look at the 10 30 on um, 30 minute, two hour, daily, weekly, monthly. It's still the 1030 in that sense. I, hopefully I've made that. I have made that clear and haven't overemphasized. So I, what I want you to recognize is that if you're looking at the monthly and you're looking and you're looking at the 270, I want you to realize that that thing is looking back at 270 monthly bars in order to come up with a uh, an RL270 curve this little bar that price if we just said that the RL10 was the price way up here that degree of stretch is looking at the you know the the last 10 months worth of data which is putting the price there and it's comparing that to 270 months which is a it's considering a 25 year look back so just think about how much price action it's going to take to make a significant change up or down in the slope of that curve so it's at you know don't con, don't think of the uh you know the 270 on the monthly is looking at 25 years. If I'm on the one minute chart and I'm looking at the 270 and I see that, that's the, di remember 270 on one minute charts is only 4.5 hours. I'm still looking at price action that happened today as opposed to price action that has been spread out over 25 years. So what I'm saying there is that the, the shift in perspective that you're getting when you're considering the uh, RLFF in, in these different look back periods, there's a real difference in the 270 on the monthly and the 270 on the one minute or the 30 minute or whatever. Even the, two, the 270 on 30 minutes is 135 hours which divided by 6.5 is 20 days. So it take, it's taking 20 days to get a significant shift in the 270, whereas this has taken 25 years. So don't lose sight of the scale of that shift as you go to the longer term time frames. Uh, I think that what you should be doing this year and for this year upcoming is spend your time here and then also I would add the 10 to 70 because this is the one that gives you pure insight about um, the long-term buy and holder and the uh, short-term trader. Um, so what you got on this one is that as price went rocketing up, you had at first they were in agreement and then they're going to become in an agreement again. But there's this period of time in here where there is a significant difference in the opinion of what traders think the price, the current price should be, and 
with the long-term buy and holder on that time frame look like? So, like, got on the if I'm looking at the one minute chart, the traders are looking at the last ten minutes and where price is, and the long-term buy and holders on one minute are really looking at um, two hundred four point five hours. So it's the difference between 10 minutes and mo and really a full day. A, a guy that's looking at that full day in the mind of a short-term trader is a long-term buy and holder. And then what that gives you, though, is that distinction between the 10 and the 270 is this great difference of opinion. That difference of opinion is what creates the volatility trade in short-term time frames. So if I can look at this as a critical state, when that RL10 has bottomed out, remember when it makes the price uh, change and has now moved an MMRB or so off the bottom, I think I've got a potential turning point. And if this if this really was a harsh winter, and even better, if this thing came back to where it was just before this explosive move to the upside, and then it is simply retraced in a harsh winter all the way back to a support level, well, I have automatically the ability to now start framing that trade in terms of units of risk. Back to what is, until proven otherwise, that's the channel. So this is where I can start taking a look at the RL90 intermediate term thing and say, hey, this is where the RL90 is. So if it only gets halfway up and hits the RL90, bang, I still got my two to one. I can take that trade to our battle drill, and then if it goes on through, maybe I can get a 4 R move from there with two positions. So now the 1030 gives you sort of the timing and the turning points. The 270 gives you a long-term target in that time frame that we can use as a reasonable price target off the out of this critical state. And then if this thing keeps failing, I can then say, well, here's the size of that move. I think it's going to do another one of those. So I can now make a, a plus RL270, and then I can project a minus RL270. Now, if I'm, and that's if, this is if I have pulled away from it to the downside. But on this one, if I wanted to see what's another leg up look like, I could just take the size of that move and say, well, maybe there's another move of similar magnitude. So that's why I would say for this year, the 10 to 70 comparison, and then just really understanding how you want to use the 1030 is enough. The intermediate idea of the 90 is, you know, is is as gravy. That's just extra goodies. This one was in regarding to uh, taking a day trade. Let's say a frog champion. We got the, it closed, it gapped down, it did a quick morning hook, and, uh, you know, it's done this, and it's looking pretty good, and we're an hour away from the close. And we say, do I want to turn that into a swing trade? The decision is based on R in hand. Yeah, I've got to have money in the bank from the intraday risk that I took. I got to have money in the bank to fund the overnight risk. How much weight do I put on other factors like sector, market, day of the week? Not really day of the week except if it's Friday. If it's Friday, I almost never am going to hold that over the weekend. Um, there's just too much news that can happen. Too much market-moving news, they wait 
for system shocks for the weekend so that people don't lose their mind and they can explain it away. Especially in like in energy and that kind of crap. Except news that they release on Sunday to spook the markets on Monday. So I don't want to be exposed to any of that. Um, well, the gap stat, remember, is telling me uh, it's how to judge the size of the next gap. So it's way, the gap stat was from all previous gaps, and it told me that when the market closed here, and now it gaps open to here, and and that is a uh, a one percent of price gap. How do I judge that? In some things like MSOS and EEM and even treasuries, that's nothing. That's not abnormal. But in something like gold um, or Home Depot, conservative large cap, that's a big gap. So the gap stat is the, it's related specifically to the target. And it tells me how should I evaluate the size of that gap to determine is this a big gap or a abnormally small gap because that's going to lead to immediate volatility and if it's a small gap it says I can bracket the current price and then the moves that come out of that very very quiet could be big that leads to surprise but normal gaps are not interesting so the gap stat helps me judge that in the moment at the open. What I would say is, rather than trying to figure out which of those is the appropriate variable to wait, I would just say, look, you took a certain amount of risk on that intraday for a certain amount of money. And that's with the ability to adjust that minute by minute to manage your risk. But the overnight trade, there's 16 hours of exposure to news that you can't do anything with unless you're trading currencies and futures. I know, yes. Um, but you got 16 hours that you have no control over. So why would you take that risk? Well, only if when you look at it on day charts or even a three-day chart or a nine-day chart that you would be willing to take that trade now with your capital, with no market's money in hand. Like it must be justifiable on the basis of patterns and reward to risk, and it has earned the swing trade money. And one of the things that you're going to do is you're then going to say, I'm going to reduce my portfolio risk even further by committing to some market's money because I have directional momentum that tells me that there's a lot of people that want to add to that tomorrow and I'm hoping to see a favorable gap in my direction. So I'm trying to increase the odds with the gains from today to fund the risk but also to create conditions that give me a better than equal shot at a favorable gap. So it's no different than any other trade it's just that you've already paid for the trade you do not want to be riskier with capital that is exposed to 16 hours of news, don't take more risk with that than you were willing to take on the intraday trade. Um, there was another question you asked about where does um, uh, where does dumb not, not dumb money, but this one, yeah, okay. So where where would I place? Um, hedge funds, actively traded mutual funds, managed money accounts, and other active investors. Well, because it's the law and it's SEC, these guys are subject to that, and they must comply with professionalism. So you're not going to see any hobbyists in that. The only hobbyists are guys who are active money 
active traders with their own money and and it there's a spillover between hobbyists think they're becoming experts and meisters but they are subject to gamblers fallacies more often than that i see more hobbyists who think they're journeymen or masters but who are one trade away from becoming gamblers it's much more likely to see movement in that direction than moving towards ex genuine expertise in my opinion so if if you took a look at just active active traders by number 1% of them are true professionals in this area some of them are actually even meisters like Gary Antonacci and guys like Bob Rourke and and they're actually artists and then 99% of them are herd behavior that are deluded into thinking that they're higher on that list than they are. And they get exposed when the bull move is over. Then I would also say that the herd itself that doesn't even try to move back, that only uh, acts on explosive moves up or down you know, the barber that becomes a trader because the internet is going up. You know, this is probably, by number, this is probably also 95% and 5%. And of that 5%, 1% true professionals and 99%. And then I will tell you, with inside this, dude, there's a lot of novices. And I would just say, hey, um, shadow indexing which is a 60-40 and an annual rebalance. And that's probably 80%, say my contacts in the industry. And this may be 18% and maybe that's 2%, I don't know. So it's a very rare breed that's up in this area. And that's why knowing those guys is pretty important, which has been really the unexpected payoff of sticking around in this education business as long as I have is that I is that the systems and models and strategies that I design are for these guys that like the foundations course is really for professional money managers that want to do more than 60 40 but these are the guys that ask the best questions so I use their input to tighten up my own systems and models and strategies so that they're satisfied and then try to share that here through education. And what matters is not the beliefs, it's replacing that with evidence to increase your performance, as we've said. And then as you push that rock up the hill, coming in with wedges, that every time you think you're good, you just put a wedge in here to prevent the backslide, and you just keep sliding up. And then you use the accumulated actual evidence of performance to create better belief prime instead of starting with stated beliefs and then trading it and then if it doesn't work then then what do I do just keep going for new sets of beliefs until something works I'd rather just go directly to the evidence see what's working and then extract beliefs from there as needed I would actually rather just have rules the rule is self-contained and it gives you the evidence to decide how much money to put on it. You don't even have to have any beliefs. And if you had to choose between beliefs and evidence, I would pick evidence provided that you knew how to make good rules and how to test rules and how to know when rules uh, are no longer working.
that gets into the world of quantitative and qualitative research, which is why I've spent 30 years becoming a doctoral level research methodologist and studied stats and quant analysis to determine what conclusions can we draw from data. That's why I specialize in that. That's, I also find it interesting, but it also is practical. Uh, regarding stops, you know, the phenomenon was this, continuing to experience being stopped out and then watching it move back in the direction of the trade. That's why the re-entry, so if I'm long here and I get out there, I got to be able to get back in here. This week alone, there were probably five trades where the first move was a scratch, nothing, and then it did this little blip, and we ended up getting right back in, and then over the next three days, it gave 10R. And right here, it looked like that was so stupid to get out just to get back in. Well, the rule said because it failed and because it was resuming, it's, the rule said get back in. I don't have to have a belief that it's going to work 60% of the time. I just know that if I follow the rules and respect my stop and get my risk out, I have a chance of getting to that if it decides to do that. But I, I just believe that that's possible, I guess. But that belief is actually based on evidence that it, that it works over long periods of time. So what I would say is re-entry, key to sanity, and, no, and when you feel bad, keep the same bet size. And when you feel really, really positive and excellent, keep the same bet size. And then you give the rules a chance to work according to the stats. If you start varying the bet size based on how you feel and how you predict, then at best you are a hobbyist, more likely you're a gambler working with the chimpanzee mind. So don't do that. What measures do I look to signal trendiness without the, without the wicks? Well, there's um, there's the ADX, there's the um, um, the risk Z. There's the the best one is the slope uh, slope stat. It tells you what the, the Z score of the slope stat tells you that in the full range of the best slope and the worst slope of the 30 period rolling RL30, it tells you what the average slope has been over the last 180 days or 180 periods. And it tells you uh, what the upper limit and lower limit of plus one and minus one are. This area is an abnormally positive trend and this one is an abnormally negative trend. So if you can if you can track on a rolling basis where your slope stat is by z score and that thing will tell you instantly where you are inside of this uh, without you don't have to, don't individual wicks is an individual bar ignore that the price is the RL10 there's no wicks on that that's a moving, that's a line that is connecting these dots. And the slope of that is the best fit of those 10 statistical prices. The slope is the winner. That tells you everything you need to know. Look on the daily report for the slope stat of the RL30. That's everything. When that RL30 reverts and crosses its own 10 period moving average, that's the fast moving average of the slope stat. 
And if that is more than, if it's outside the plus or minus one boundary, that is a significant turning point every time. And what you're going to see most often is a reversion to the mean and an overshot. And then if it gets outside of normal, this is going to be such an amazing bear market move. That is everything on every time frame. The confirmation, this is the, um, you know, the, uh, that slope stat. If you watch, if you also watch the RL10 and the RL30 of price, when the, the owl, the owl is a very nice demarcation of turning points. It happens, you have to wait a little bit longer sometimes, like you can get great entries when the RL10 reverses. But the RL30 is the final confirmation. Yeah, this is like that uh, options trade you showed. Um, when those algos are moving 50 billion around, remember that's at least 20 to 1. So they may, they're only moving 1 to 5 billion around to get that much purchasing power and when they're operating in microseconds or nanoseconds in short time frames the amount of money that they're getting for the amount of money they have to put up is small but you got to remember how many transactions that is and it's the return on and cap because they're getting so many inventory turns it's the volat it's the second derivative that matters. So that's why I don't try to compete on ticks. That the sweet spot is the three minute, thirty minute for guys that don't want to play the algo game, but who have to take big positions because of the demands of their uh, their um, investment contract. Uh, a different gentleman from the Kata 2 course says, hey, now what's funny is, I tried not to be snarky, but as you know, the Foundations is a very wide survey of a lot of my beliefs about systems, self, and market. And the Kata 2 challenge takes one system, one strategy, and then goes deep, 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 deep into implementing beliefs and techniques. So there's a kid that's in the Kata 2 course and saying, hey, since this Kata 2 is based on Ken Long systems, I'm wondering what his top trading beliefs are, which matter to us and are learning about this system. What are his beliefs about the market behind the system and personal trading beliefs. I'm, he'd like some more context for his... He has no idea of the ass whooping that he's asking for because what he really asked for was not just the foundations but also the advanced core swing and day trading courses and the beliefs behind the hybrid hybrid trading plus all the beliefs about creativity 202 plus all of the beliefs about systems thinking and adult learning which gets into so that's what he's really asking for and so what I said well if you want him to get that just hey we just wrote a 300 page book on that subject and if that's not enough he could take the foundations course which has about a thousand plus hours of my beliefs and the patreon archive has about 2000 hours of four years of recorded nightly strategy podcasts which is about a thousand daily sessions times 90 minutes on each one gives you 2000 hours 
and every system that I publish describes the beliefs and concepts associated with that particular system. And then my homepage has ex hundreds of hours of free materials. And then the YouTube channel has 3,000 public videos, which is me describing beliefs. So I would say, if you really got to know, read the book. And pay attention to what these guys, who've been abused as my interns and understudies for two years, and who finally put that course together with my blessing and supervision, everything they're teaching you is, is the minimum information set. And then there's the other ebooks that I've written on Amazon, if you still need more about what my beliefs are. It's almost it makes my head hurt just to think. Oh, and there's also the glossary. And I have an entire Rizuku course on systems thinking. Anyway, so that's everything for today. Um, and um, we'll get this thing recorded and posted later tonight. So good questions. Hopefully we filled in some of the gaps um, for you today. Okay. So thanks a lot, guys. And we'll see you soon. Keep working hard.